November 13th, Mary mentioned about how much it will affect this city um, and surrounding community, but it will also affect our province and our country as well, and it will dictate uh, many of people's futures. For myself, I'm standing here, I'm living in this city, raising my kids in this city because of 88, because of uh, when they built the Olympic Oval, uh, became a national training center. That's why I moved from Saskatoon to Calgary. So it is the legacy. And as we stand here in a living legacy of the 88 games, a uh, place like Windsport, I'm going to tell you, it's the envy of the world. All these legacy facilities are. They're still, with all the improvements that have been done, they're still world class and number one in the world. Now, these facilities came at a price. And uh, the question being asked is, is the price worth it? So that's where we put this panel together. And um, this panel is about sport in Calgary. Uh, it's about the legacy and about the future. So I want to bring up our panelists. Uh, first member of the panel, she was born and raised in Alberta. She won the Olympic trials in 2009 in order to qualify for the games, uh, where she won silver in Vancouver 2010, named as alternate for 2018 Pyeongchang for the curling team, skipped by Rachel Holman. She has been an incredible mentor to so many athletes. She's an incredible leader. She's recently been named CEO of Canada Sports Hall of Fame. Please welcome Cheryl Bernard. A uh, three-time Paralympian in biathlon and Nordic skiing. At the 2018... Paralympic Games in Pyeongchang, he won a Canadian single games record six medals, five individual, a team relay medal, including biathlon gold, silver, bronze, and his first cross-country medals. He was honored as Canada's flag bearer for the game's closing ceremony. He just returned from PEI, where he was given the order of Prince Edward Island. Please welcome Mark Arends. Now, I would like to welcome uh, a young athlete, born in Calgary, raised in Canmore. She started cross-country skiing at, uh, at the age of six, started biathlon at the age of 12. She's been a competitor in track and field at the provincial level. This year, she's once again part of the Biathlon Alberta Training Center. She's a member of the U20 team, and her goal is this year to qualify for the IBU Tour Junior Worlds in Slovakia and Canada Games in Red Deer 2019, up-and-comer with a focus on Beijing 2022 and 2026, wherever that might be. Please welcome Anna Sellers. And our final panelist, a VP and Senior Economist of ATB Financial, Todd provides economic commentary for many Canadian media outlets. He has served on the University of Calgary Board of Governors. He's the chair of the Calgary Arts Academy and on the board of Glenbow. Todd recently received the University of Alberta's Alumni Honor Award and an honorary degree from Mount Royal University. He's written three books. He's always on the road all over Alberta, every small town, every city, uh, all over the country. Please welcome Todd Hirsch. We talk about legacy, and again, I want to talk legacy and then the future. The Hall of Fame is the ultimate legacy of Canada and sport. I mean, those who haven't been in there, this is an incredible facility, but anybody from sport, when they are named, uh, inducted into the hall and named a Hall of Honor member, um, you know, it, it is the huge, hugest honor and legacy of sport in Calgary. It's in Calgary because of 88. So how do we sustain that legacy? How do we sustain the legacy, but also the hall, so that the next generation can celebrate sport in this country? Yeah, you know, people talk so much about the legacy as in facilities that are left over. And when I look at legacy, and especially where I am at Sports Hall of Fame, I think of legacy as the champions from the podium that now become champions in our community. And they're role models. Katrina is a Hall of Famer over at the Sports Hall of Fame. She's become a role model, an influencer. She speaks out about the benefits and the lessons in sport. And that has the ability to unite us. And so I think Canada Sports Hall of Fame, our job is to continue to share those stories, those legacies. Because if they're forgotten, then what is left? They talk about the people who forget their history or their culture is like a tree with no roots. And so that's our job. We form our national identity by becoming an educational community and continuing to share these incredible stories of these athletes into eternity. 
And, you know, it's, it's funny because some people say, well, athletes, and then they become just role models. Business leaders, too. Yourself, uh, we look at that video, uh, Kyle Schufeld, business owner. So many athletes go on to do so many things within the community. And you know what the important thing is? Is we stay in this community. We, we don't often leave. We stay right here. Um, Mark, the next question is to you. You know, Cheryl's talking about... Uh, the, the hall, and in one week time in Toronto is the huge uh, banquet for the Hall of Fame induction for the 2018 um, new members. One of the new members is one of Canada's greatest Paralympians, Jeff Adams. Um, the fact that parasport is, is becoming so front and center, um, and Jeff going into the hall, what does that mean for the para movement? I, th I think it's uh, amazing. Uh, we're seeing it all the time. That's our biggest sports stars are now starting to become Paralympians. Uh, and coming from that side, I've lived and trained with one of the greatest, uh, Brian McKeever, um, for the last 12, 13 years now. And y you see that excitement for Paralympics growing. And that is a Canadian legacy, not an 88 legacy, but a Vancouver legacy. They were the first ones to say, okay, the Olympic and Paralympic Games and bringing that together and now that's the standard across the world um, is that Olympic and Paralympic Games are put together um, and that it's not longer a bid for the Olympics, it's a bid for the Paralympics and I think that started in Canada and uh, I'm excited to see what Calgary can do with that, uh, with their first Paralympics here. Um, in my opinion, and it might be wrong, but you'll be awestruck by the Olympics, but you'll be inspired by the Paralympics. And uh, I th really would like to see that opportunity uh, taken here in Calgary. He's just bragging right now because of his eight medals out there. You know, six, for, six from one game. Cheryl and I are looking going, okay, okay. I'll, like overachiever much. But, uh, you know, I, I think... It's about the right sport. <laughs> I picked the wrong one, Cheryl, you too. Anna, I don't know, you might want to relook at this. Um, you know, I think key on that is even as Mary was talking and, and the video, and, you know, I mistakenly said COC because that video was done by COC and CPC, uh, but up on Calgary 2026 are the two logos. This was not the case for so many years that the Olympic movement and the Paralympic movement were together, and they are now, and that's, that really is incredible. We'll come back to uh, 2010 and, and, and sort of the awareness of the first para games in, in Canada a little bit later. Um, Anna, the next question is for you. Um, so you live at home which I, I kind of say with a little bit of envy because most athletes, we move to a city to continue our sporting dreams. You've been able to stay at home in Canmore. You, you train alongside people like Mark. Um, what has that been like for you to be able to have one of the best facilities in the world right in your backyard? Um, it's been absolutely amazing. Yeah, so my entire team, every other member of it has come from other parts of Canada just to train at the world-class facilities that are in Canmore. I've been fortunate enough, it's five minutes away from where I've lived my entire life. Like, I don't know, I'm beyond grateful for my parents who just like let me live there. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> and so, yeah, just, and then that the team is there and that all the facilities I need and even like the testing is in Calgary. Calgary is so close to us. It's 45 minutes to get to here to one sport for all of our testing. Like. I don't know, just growing up, I'm so fortunate and I'm just really grateful for the legacy that 88 did make so that the Nordic Center is in Canmore now and Calgary's here for all of us athletes, yeah. And as you talk about testing against a partnership with uh, CSI and, and Dale and the team there and the fact that they're at Windsport in the Oval and everybody's able to learn from each other, all of that testing, the medical staff as well. That's why became, Canada has truly become uh, one of the best in the world. Todd, question for you. Over 30 years since 88 Games, just about now, 31 years since these venues opened, um, we talk about economic impact. Can you talk about the economic impact of amateur sport from the 88 games? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, first of all, I want to say this has got to be the coolest panel I've ever been on. I'm the only non-athlete up here, and that puts me in a unique spot. When I was uh, growing up, the only team I was on was chess club, uh, at which I did excel, by the way, but it's not an Olympic sport. But, um, Yet. 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 
Well, maybe we'll work on that. But to your question, the economic value of, of sport and, and legacy facilities, I've long been an advocate in what I, I coined the CARS sector, culture, art, recreation, and sport. I think they are often undervalued, and we don't talk about them or appreciate them uh, as much as we should from an economic value. And why I say that is when a city like Calgary is looking at trying to attract the best and brightest from all around the world, come recessions or, or you know, booms and busts we go through, we're always trying to attract the best and brightest. And the availability of those cars as sectors means a huge amount. People will move to a city you know, maybe because there's a good fly fishing or maybe a good rodeo. Uh, that'll attract a certain amount of people, and those are important, but the broader smorgasbord of uh, culture, art, recreation, and sport facilities we have available, the more attractive our city will be, and that's why as an economist, I can't emphasize enough the importance of legacy facilities like Windsport, uh, like the Oval, like uh, the Nordic Center, all of those things that make, uh, add to the quality of life and attractiveness of a city. Yeah, and, you know, we had a great partnership, Sport Calgary, with uh, various, various other partners. And on our website, f to look at also actual numbers, um, you can go on our website. And we have uh, a study that was done thanks to Tim Barrett, who's in the room here. Um, uh, to you again, Todd, um, you know, we, okay, we talk about troubled economic times. Similar to when uh, Calgary was looking at bidding, uh, early 80s, um, can you talk a little bit about what that process looks like for us? But then also talking about, you know, just before the event started, uh, you mentioned that Pyeongchang just released um, an economic benefit uh, from the games. And yet they weren't in the situation that we were in that have these facilities. So I guess a two-part question to you. Yeah, well, comparing and contrasting the 80s and I guess the uh, current situation we're in, the, the 80s, when I look at the sort of the, the diagnosing uh, a recession, by almost every measure, the 80s in Alberta was worse. Now, it's not necessarily that it was worse for every individual person, but the economic hit that this city took in 1982 and 84 and 86, and it went on through the 80s. Uh, I didn't live here in the 80s. I actually lived in a city you might have heard 300 kilometers north called Edmonton, uh, which we tried to build the Olympics as Alberta's Olympic Games back in 1988. It, didn't fly down here, but uh, we looked on at that, you know, I think with, with some envy. Now, the 80s was a different period of time. It was maybe a more innocent period. I don't know how you would describe it. Uh, I think the challenges and opportunities in 2026 for this city are much different. Uh, we have to understand that we're not just replicating 1988, but I think in both situations, the comparison is, here is a city and a province that was beat down hard by a recession morally and, and, and sort of emotionally dragged down. And there's a lot of disappointment, there's a lot of frustration still in the city as we climb out of this. Uh, something like an Olympic Games to look forward to, to build towards, I think might have the same effect that the 1988 Games did. Of course, me saying this not having lived through that, but observing what the city went through in the 80s. Uh, it could happen again. And what about, uh, I'm just gonna throw out that Pyeongchang thing. Uh, oh, 50, was it yeah. 55 million? Well, that's the headline I saw. Now, I'm sure there's people in the room that know all about this, but you know, I'm scrolling through my Twitter and there was a, a news headline that the Pyeongchang uh, reported a, a surplus of 55 million. Um, this came earlier this week. Now, the details of it, I, I can't speak to, but when I saw that, I thought, why are people making a bigger deal of this? You know, because it shows, in fact, that these things still. Uh, you know, can be profitable. And I don't think profit should be the motivation to do it, but at least they're not going to, you know, run billions and billions of dollars into debt. So, okay, you talk, um, we talked dollars and cents. Cheryl, I'm, I'm turning to you. Uh, Vancouver 2010. You know, games, and Mary mentioned it, it's about social benefit and everything, but the way they can change a community, uh, what was it like for you in Vancouver? I mean, uh, as a medalist also, but a home games. I mean, I, I never got that opportunity. My closest were Salt Lake City, but what was it like for you, um, just the whole spirit of the games, more than just that economic side? Yeah, you know, I think the, the greatest impact that Olympics or national championship events can create is the inclusive community that it creates. It was unbelievable. 
I remember, I have to tell a quick story, I jumped into a taxi cab from the Olympic Village, I was going to go have dinner with my husband. I get in this cab, this guy, it, the whole cab was decked out, it was like a Canadian souvenir store. He had a Canadian flag across the dash and one across the back seat, he had a Canadian toque on, he had Canadian mitts on. And I'm like, so, Canadian fan, are you? And he's so excited. He's like, I am, I am. He said, this has been the most ex amazing experience I've ever had in this country. And I said, well, where were you from originally? And he said, New Delhi. And then he realized I was an Olympic athlete. Well, he just went on. He's like, what was it like to wear the maple leaf? How was that with the opening ceremonies? And finally, we got to where we were going. And I turned to him and I said, thank you. Thank you for being a Canadian fan. Thank you for being a Team Canada fan. And he turned around to me, and I'll never forget, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I have been in this country for seven years, and this is the first time I have ever been felt part of it, that I've ever felt Canadian. He said, we all come together and we cheer together, and we share the same values, and we share the same interests. And so that's what I believe it does. It unites our country, it forms our identity, it brings us together. And how could Calgary ever turn down that opportunity to be a leader in our country and do such a thing? So that's what I remember from 2010. You know, it, I think the nation went in there saying for the first time, because before this, I don't know if everybody remembers, but before 2010, Canada actually hadn't won a gold on home soil. So we'd hosted Olympics twice, 76 and 88. Canada had never, we we're the only country in the world to, ha to have this statistic, not a good st statistic to have. We we're the only nation to have never won a gold. And media started saying, will it happen? Athletes on the side were saying, and this is on the Olympic side, Athletes were saying, oh, it'll happen, it's how many? And they ended up winning 14 gold, which was a winter nation record. And I believe that's the point where Canada kind of said, we're not going to apologize for being great anymore. We're going to just state that we are the best. And that's where it started, and it brought people together. Now, Mark, you mentioned about the Para Games. Um, first time the Canada's hosted a Paralympics. Uh, what was it like for you, and, and I guess... Maybe putting your eyes, your eyesight on what people were seeing. Um, you know, you said about Paralympics being inspiring. Uh, do you think there were surprises? Like, were there, what was it like for you to see many people seeing Parasport for the very first time? Um, honestly, I was almost overwhelmed with what I was seeing. It was my first game, so I was, it was just a new level. The games were a new level of competition um, with, against my rivals. They were... They, some of them had been there before, some of them were a lot more experienced than I was, and they were ready to compete. But what Canada saw was every person out there uh, had a story, had something they overcame. Um, I lost my arm when I was seven, and it was through sport that it gave me that opportunity to be who I wanted to be. Um, I always wanted to push forward uh, and show my abilities, and not the disability that I had, and sport allowed me to do that. I still had two great legs to run with, and so I used that to my advantage in uh, elementary, junior high, high school, um, and now I use that to even further, and now I've, yeah, like you said earlier, three Paralympics. But what Vancouver showed was just a different perspective of the games. It wasn't just, the games are not, um, para games, there's always been a, a misconception that Para of Paralympics means para, uh, paraplegic. And that was never the case. It's actually parallel. And so Paralympics actually stands for parallel games. And that is, I think, in Vancouver, is the first time the world actually saw that, um, that the games were equally important. Um, they're not the driving force, the Paralympics. Um, and, you know, we always like to have a, a few jokes that the Olympics are the uh, test event for the Paralympics. All the, all the problems are ironed out during the Olympics and the, the Paralympics are perfect. Um, and it was just amazing to see the support within Vancouver, Whistler, where I was up in the, in the Whistler Olympic Park and across the country for Paralympic sport. And I think that's grown um, with every Paralympics that's come. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where it's, it keeps going. Anna, you were in Vancouver uh, with your mom and dad watching. Uh, what was your favorite memory of that? Um, so yeah, I would have been 10 when the Olympics were in Vancouver. <laughs> um. Cheryl, we were 12. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to say what I, how old I was. Or... 
But yeah, um, I just remember I've grown up watching like World Cups at the Nordic Center, but just the Olympics was just like a whole other like event. Like it was so like having so many sports all together at once, just seeing the whole country come together. Um, I had fun watching individual events. Like I love watching biathlon and cross country, obviously. Um, probably my favorite events to watch, but probably my highlight was just watch, walking around the streets in both uh, up in Whistler and in Vancouver and just seeing how excited everyone was getting. Just, I don't know, kind of like your story, you're saying just everyone was like Canadian, decked out, so excited and just so many sports together. That just got me excited and want, made me really happy and proud to be Canadian, I guess. Yeah, it was a fun time. <laughs> Uh, Todd, we talked, uh, you talked about cars and the, uh, the cultural side. Um, you know, these guys are talking Vancouver in 2010 and how it brought a community g together. We are a different city than we were in 88. Uh, we're much more diverse. I would think we're more uh, welcoming. We're more inclusive. But do you think the rest of the world, do you think the rest of Canada, but also the rest of the world, sees us maybe as cultural as, as we see ourselves, as we look at the games and that huge component of not just the sport, but the cultural Olympiad? Yeah, it's a great question how the rest of the world, how the rest of the country, how they view Calgary. Uh, this has been something that in my 29 years in this city, I've always been curious because as a city, we are, we do care about what the rest of the world thinks about us and how we reflect on, on uh, what our image reflects to the rest of the world. We are a different city. I think there's no question, we're a almost double the size, I would say, um, much more uh, multicultural, much more, um, I think, sophisticated in our world outlook. Uh, but it's not to say we can't improve and, and continue to grow on that. I think the Olympics, uh, hosting an Olympic Games would be that opportunity for Calgary to maybe showcase that. And the other thing I would add that's always been a part of this city is do we need to consider that Calgary, Canada, Maybe we need to step up and take some, some leadership and show the rest of the world that these games don't need to be these $50 billion fiascos. I think that's why fewer countries are bidding on them. I think this is maybe our opportunity to step up and take a turn and say, look, we can show that you guys can do this. And maybe in that respect, get it back on track, get it back to maybe the spirit of, of how the Olympics used to be, where cities were fall and countries were falling all over themselves to compete. Uh, my sense is, and people in this room know far more about this than I ever will, but you know, there's fewer and fewer countries, especially at the winter um, games, that are, are stepping up. And I think it's because of fear of cost overruns. And this is maybe where Canada needs to take some leadership and show. And I think if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in this city and the talent that's represented in this room. And I'm looking at you, Mary, and Scott, and, and all the others. Uh, the confidence I have in this city and, and our business leaders in being able to pull off a, a, a an unprecedented uh, games so that can get it back on track and show the world that in fact these things can be done uh, on budget and they don't need to be all uh, corrupt and over budget. You know, I could, uh, bars open, food is being served, but I could sit here for hours and just continue this conversation. But I'm going to go uh, last round of questions for each person. Um, Anna, I'm going to start with you. Um, from the perspective of a young athlete, What's the best thing that could happen uh, moving forward with sport in this community? Um, I think that the best thing could honestly be getting that games. Um, just me growing up in Canmore, like I said before, I grew up watching World Cup athletes. Like when I was little watching Becky Scott, Sarah Runner, Shauna Crawford, them winning World Cups, getting medals, though, that just like inspired me. That was my goal when I was little. Everyone else is like, oh, I want to be a ballerina. I want to be a firefighter. I wanted to win a World Cup medal in my hometown. And like, just to have an Olympics in our hometown, that will inspire so, so many kids. And it's not just one sport like cross country, it's all of them. And it's just gonna have such a lasting impact on just not only like kids, but just the entire city. And I don't know, I just think that it would be the best thing for the city, yeah. Uh, Mark, if... Um you know, if, if we do move forward and host an Olympic and Paralympic Games, what would that do for, for this community of, of Calgary, Canmore, Al Alberta, and Canada for uh, para sport? I think it'll be that, that next boost, continuing on from Vancouver and the games that have followed. Uh, I think that's the next step. It's, um, 
I recognize that it'll never be equal. There is, you know, far more events, more athletes involved at the Olympic side, but I think the importance of both games can be equal. And I think that, um, you know, we look at when we go with a small World Cup to a town and the town changes, just, you know, people are scrambling just to find enough wheelchair accessible rooms. And I think the games coming and the Paralympics coming to Calgary and to Canmore and, and beyond uh, will showcase true accessibility within a city and allowing not only the high level, the highest level of sport to be uh, practiced in the city, but also recreation. Um, you know, uh, and, it'll, and just a small thing would be just to make sure our sidewalks are clean for wheelchair users um, or a visually impaired that are using a, a sighting cane. Things like this will change um, with the Paralympics here in the game, at the Games. And there are those little challenges within uh, hosting the Paralympic Games. And I think uh, Calgary is more than capable of hosting or uh, dealing with those uh, challenges that come. You know, we talk about uh, reviving facilities, but what about reviving that spirit and that uh, <laughs> revival of that volunteerism? And all of the people who, I believe, still wear the 88 jackets, and they're cool again, those so nice jackets. Uh, what about reviving um, that side if Calgary moves forward? I, I mean, I think we've seen it in Calgary. We saw it with the floods. Calgary is that kind of a city, and every time we have a challenge, we rise to it. And I think that's just what I expect to see from the city again and the opportunity for all of us um, volunteers to come together to be part of building something really amazing for a nation, not let alone just a city or a province. This is for a country. I, I think that does so well beyond the economic benefits of it. It just does so well for the mental state of, of our city and our province and our country. Uh, Todd, final question. You kind of touched on it the last time, and, and this might not even be fair to ask you, but I, it's a bit of a two-part question. Can Calgary do it, and should Calgary do it? Well, I don't think there's any doubt Calgary could do it. I think if there's any city in the world that can pull this off, it's, it's this city. You know, I did touch on that. Should we do it? Um, that's a question that's going to be up to Calgarians. But, you know, when, when we think about every one of us who's going to be voting in, in, the, in the plebiscite, uh, there's a few things we need to keep in mind. One is, yeah, the dollars and cents. And that is something that we need to get a good handle on. And, and I know Mary's group has put together those things. And I don't have any doubt of the, of the numbers. That seems to be what everyone's fixated on. How much is it going to cost? How much is it going to cost? What's the economic benefit? How many jobs are going to be created? All of that is important to understand. But it's not the full question. So the question, should we do it? The full question needs to consider would we, as Calgarians, as Canadians, would we be disappointed if, in, if we don't host it, if we don't bid, and in a few years the winter movement dies out? I don't know. My guess is, if you surveyed Canadians, you'd probably find some hey, branches who would say that they don't care if it, if it continues or not. But my guess is most Canadians would say, no, this is our chance. This is when we really show up. The Paralympic and, and Olympic Winter Games, this is our chance on the podium. Summer, yeah, but winter, this is really our, our chance. I think we would be disappointed if the Winter Olympic movement died out. I think we might regret not taking the shot to say we can host the best games in, in winter, maybe better than 88. Uh, I think we would regret it. Well, Minister of Sport, Kirsty Duncan has said, if Canada does it, we would do it best in class. And she has said uh, Canada needs to be given that opportunity. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our panelists, Todd Hirsch, Anna Sellers, Mark Arendt, Cheryl Bernard. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you.